Okay, let's get into chapter 5, 5.1, Areas and Distances. This is a very important topic, a very important section, especially for those of you who are going to be going on into the wonderful world of Calculus 2. This is going to really form the foundation for a lot of what you're going to be doing in Calculus 2. And the idea here is that um, there's going to be an occasion in Calculus, many occasions, where you're interested in finding the area underneath the curve between two points. So suppose we want to find the area under some curve, y equals f of x, some function, um, and of course above the x-axis from x equals a to x equals b. So just a quick idea of what we're doing here and of course this looks familiar from your reading in the book. We have some value x equals a, some value x equals b and over that range we have uh, some curve from a to b. Alright, one way we're going to do this is by approximating the area using areas of rectangles. So we want to find the area of what we're calling here s. S is the area that we're trying to find. So one thing we're going to do, just a general idea here, is we're going to divide this up into subsections. So however many you want to do, you can divide up the uh, interval between A and B into subsections. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose either the right endpoint, the left endpoint, or the midpoint. Let's go ahead and say I'm going to choose the right endpoint. What I'm going to do is I'm going to form rectangles by taking the right endpoint of each subinterval and going up until I hit the graph and then forming a rectangle that way. So you can see what we'd have here. We'd have something that looks like this. So just again starting on the right end point of each subinterval, going up until I hit the graph y equals f of x and then forming my rectangle based on that. So I have rectangles whose width is equal to the distance of each of these subintervals and whose height is equal to the value of the function at each of those points. Now you can see that if we add up the area of the rectangles we're going to get an approximation of the actual area that we're looking for which is S. And hopefully you can see that if we did more rectangles or more subintervals which would result in more rectangles so maybe we did this instead well what's going to happen then? You're going to have much more rectangles and you're going to have a better approximation of the area if we doubled the number of rectangles here and again I'm just using the right endpoint so twice as many subintervals and if you look at the difference between the area of the orange rectangles and the actual area under the curve which we're calling S and the area of the blue rectangles and the actual area under the curve you can see the difference between the area and the orange rectangles is a better approximation of the actual area S so that tells us if we have more rectangles that we get a better approximation. And so that's a key concept of what it is that we're going to be doing. Now let's look at uh, a couple of examples. And let's suppose we want to approximate the area of the function f of x equals 1 over x from x equals 1 to x equals 3. And let's go ahead and first of all we'll use these right endpoints. And um, let's go ahead and use, well, let's just use 4 subintervals just kind of keep things easy. So this is similar to what your book did with the function y equals x squared from 0 to 1. They use four subintervals. We're going to use four subintervals with this function here. So if we take a look at our function, uh, we're going from 1 to, to 3. Now at uh, x equals 1, the function value is 1. I'm going to make the y scale a little bit different so we have a clear contrast. Um, let's see, at x equals 2, 1 over 2 is 1 half and 1 third. So we have a function that looks kind of a, de well, not kind of, it is a decreasing function. Looks something like this. All right, and it should be a little, well, it's a little smoother here, concave up. Anyway, what we're looking for is this area here. So we're trying to find the area between 1 and 3 under this curve S. Now we said we want to use four subintervals. So let's go ahead and use four subintervals. So we're going to divide up the section from one to three into four equal subintervals. So I'm going to go ahead and say um, we'll take it one at one and a half and two and a half. All right, so here's my four subintervals from one to one point five, from one point five to two, two to two point five, two point five to three. Now I'm going to be using right endpoints we said. So that means I'm going to look at my first subinterval from 1 to 1.5, the right point of that is 1.5, I'm going to take my height of my triangle to be the function value at that point. So there we have it. And I'm going to come over and say, alright, here is my rectangle. 
Then I have the height at 2. All right, and then at 2.5, and then at 3. Now, if we have S1, S2, S3, and S4, those four rectangles, which we can say are going to be those, the areas of those four rectangles, that's an approximation of the actual area under the rectangle, the area under the curve, which we called S. So S is going to be approximated by the sum of these four rectangles, S1, S2, S3, and S4 which is equal to, all right, well, let's see, the area of this rectangle is the width times the height. The width is 0.5 times the height. Well, the height is the function evaluated at my right endpoint, f of 1.5, or f of 3 halves, plus s2. Well, it has a width of 0.5 times the function evaluated at the right endpoint, which is x equals 2, so times f of 2 plus, again, a width of 0.5 times the function evaluated at 2.5, or 5 halves, plus a width of 0.5 times the function evaluated at 3. So what do we get then? We get 0.5 times, now remember what we're putting into, this, these points into, we're putting into 1 over x, so that's just going to flip it. So it's going to be 0.5 times 2 thirds, plus a half times 1 half, plus a half times 2 fifths, plus a half times one-third. Let's continue this down here. So S is approximated by, let's see, one-half times two-thirds, that's, um, well, let's just write it this way, one-half times two-thirds plus one-half times a half plus one-half times uh, two-fifths plus one-half times a third. So we get an approximation of um, Let's see, this is just a third plus a fourth plus a fifth plus a sixth, which is equal to 57 over 60, or 0.95. Now, this should be an under-approximation of the area, because notice that we have some error here. Notice what the error is. It's this area here, here. This area is not accounted for. So this should actually be, we're pretty sure, this actually should be less than the actual area which is S. Now, what if we used, we want to do the same thing, but this time we wanted to use left endpoints. So we want to do the same thing, only use left endpoints for our function. So we're going to have the same setup. We're going to have the same function. F of x equals 1 over x from 1 to 3. So we have, uh, let's see, F of 1 is 1, F of 3 is 1 third, F of 2 is 1 half, so we have this function looks like that. We'll use four subintervals, so four subintervals also for the left endpoint. All right, so let's see, this is two right here, and so to get our subintervals, we're going to say here's 1.5, here's 2.5. Now using left endpoints, we're going to use the first endpoint here, one, and that's going to be the height of my rectangle. Okay, now this endpoint, the left, this subinterval from 1.5 to 2, the left endpoint is 1.5, so that's the height of my rectangle. From 2 to 2.5, the left endpoint is 2, so that's the height. And from 2.5 to 3, the left endpoint is 2.5, so that gives me the height. Now the, here you can see we're going to have an over approximation. So S is going to be approximately equal to, well, the area of each of these triangles added together. Remember the width of each of these is going to be 0.5, so we have 0.5 times. Well, here we're taking f of 1 plus 0.5 times f of 1.5, or 3 halves, plus 0.5 times f of the left endpoint of this third rectangle, third interval is 2, plus 0.5 times f of 2.5, or 5 halves. Now, what does this give us? This is equal to 0.5 times, let's see, f of 1 is 1, plus 0.5 times f of 3 halves is 2 thirds. Remember our function is just 1 over x, so it just flips it. Plus 0.5 times f of 2, which is a half, plus 0.5 times f of 5 halves, which is 2 fifths. So this is equal then to s is approximated by, let's see, we get 0.5 times 1, plus, uh, let's write it this way, a half times 2 thirds, plus a half times a half, plus a half times two-fifths. So we get a half plus a third plus a fourth plus a fifth, which is equal to 
77 over 60 or about 1.2833 and so on. Now this should be bigger than the actual area under the curve which we again are calling this whole area here S. It's bigger because you can see we have an overestimate with these rectangles. So it looks like if we have a decreasing function the left endpoints are going to give you an overestimate while the right endpoints are going to give you an underestimate. And the opposite is going to be true for an increasing function as we'll be able to see here in a second. Let's look at an increasing function like this one right here. Here we have the function y equals x squared so just like what they did in the book and we're going from 0 to 1. Here we have looks like 1, 2, 3, 4 five subintervals from 0 to 1 and that only gives us four rectangles. We're using left endpoints so we're using left hand rectangles here and you can see this is going to be an underestimate. For an increasing function the left hand rectangles are going to be an underestimate. But now look what happens as we increase the number of subintervals. If we go from n equals 5 to n equals 10 we've doubled the number of rectangles here even though this first one here is still a height of 0 because the left endpoint is x equals 0 and 0 squared is 0, but we get a better approximation. The actual area under this curve from 0 to 1 of x squared is 1 third, 0.333. The approximation with 10 subintervals is 0.285, off by 0.0483. If we go to 15 subintervals, now we're getting closer. Again, the actual area is 1 third. Here we're at 0.3. If we go to 30, getting closer yet. 50, you can see we have a better approximation and 150 we have a very good approximation or accurate in fact all the way out to the thousandth place. Alright now what happens if we go five subintervals and right hand rectangles? Well here we have an overestimate. So an increasing function using right hand uh, rectangles is going to give us an overestimate of the actual area under the curve and you can see why that's the case. These rectangles obviously have more area when you add them together than the area under that curve. 0.44 is the estimate area for five sub-rectangles. Again, the actual area is still one-third. If we go to 10, we're getting closer. 15, closer yet. 30, 50, and 150, we get a very good approximation. Again, accurate all the way out to the thousandth place. So it appears that the more rectangles we use, the better approximation we're going to get. The more sub-intervals we use, the better approximation we're going to get, and that's exactly going to be the case. So let's go ahead and generalize this. So let's go back to our original situation. We just want to find the area under some function y equals f of x from x equals a to x equals b. So we'll have some function here and let's say it's both increasing and decreasing over that interval. So we're looking for this area right here which we will call, again we'll call this area s. Alright, so what we're going to do then is we're going to divide this into some sub-intervals just like we did before. So we're going to divide this up into a bunch of subintervals, maybe some number in subintervals. So let's suppose here that we have, I'm not going to bother the count, I'm just trying to keep things general here, in subintervals. All right, now what's the width of each of these subintervals? Well, remember when we had an overall width from A to B of 2, when we did four subintervals, the width of each subinterval was 0.5 or 1 half. So that makes sense because you're taking 2 and dividing it into four pieces and then you're going to get 0.5. So your width of the subinterval is going to be called delta x. That's the change in x, remember. And we can always be able to find that by taking the end point b minus the beginning point a. So that's basically how far we're traveling along the x-axis and dividing that by the number of subintervals in. That'll give us the width of each subinterval. So as the book says on page 347 here, that'll divide this subinterval into in subintervals. Now we usually call a x sub 0. And then we go from there, x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3, and so on. And we call b x sub n when we start labeling these x values of the subintervals. All right. Now, if we let r sub n equal the right subinterval approximation, so we're using right hand endpoints, which again means we're going to be taking the height of our rectangles based on the function value on the right side of each of these sub in subintervals. So r sub n is the right endpoint approximation. Then what is r sub n going to be equal to? Well, just like it says there in the book, r sub n is going to be equal to. All right, well, let's just look at a couple of rectangles that we're looking at. We have the right interval at x sub 1. 
first rectangle has a height of this value right here, which is the function evaluated at x sub 1. So r sub n is going to be the function f evaluated at x sub 1 times the width of our rectangle, which we're calling delta x. So f of x sub 1 times delta x plus. What's the next one? The next one's going to have a height given by the function value at x sub 2. So it's going to be a height of f of x sub 2 times the width of that rectangle, which is delta x. So on and so on until we get this last rectangle here, which is going to have a height of f of b, which, remember, is equal to f of x sub n, because we're calling b x sub n. n, again, can be any number of subintervals that you want to divide your overall interval from a to b into. So we have f of x sub n times delta x. Now, notice that we have in this formula here, we have a delta x in common everywhere, with every term. So we can factor that delta x out. In fact, I'm going to factor it out on the end of this thing. Well, before we do that, I'll try and stay consistent with what they say here. Remember what we said, that if we use more and more subintervals, in other words, as we let n get bigger, our approximation gets better and better and better. So the actual area then under the curve we can define to be the limit as n goes to infinity. As n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, in other words, we get more and more subintervals, as we saw in this example here, our approximation of the area under the curve based on the areas of those rectangles gets better and better and better. So it makes sense that as we let n go to infinity and take the limit of r sub n, which is the limit as n goes to infinity of our formula here, f of x sub 1 times delta x plus f of x sub 2 times delta x and so on, f of x sub n times delta x. This is actually equal to the area. This is going to be our definition at this point for the area under a curve between the, the, uh, the points x equals a and x equals b. Now, as the book points out, then, we could also use the limit as n goes to infinity of the left end points, which we can call L sub n. Now, the left end points would just be the function evaluated, first of all, at x sub 0, which is our a, a value here. So evaluated here, remember what those would look like. We would have the first rectangle, for example, would look like this. The height is f of x sub 0 times delta x plus f of x sub 1 times delta x. Our last endpoint then, if b is x sub n, well then the, uh, the subinterval right before b has a, well the subinterval, that last subinterval has a left endpoint of x sub n minus 1. So that would be f of x sub n minus 1 times delta x. So that is another way to define the area as a limit as n goes to infinity of the left-hand endpoint approximations. All right, and then finally, let's introduce some notation for this section, um, for this, what we call sigma notation. And so if we're going to add up a bunch of these things, if we're going to say uh, that we have f of x sub 1 delta x plus f of x sub 2 delta x, and so on, f of x sub n delta x. Remember, this was our right-hand subinterval summation. We can say that this is equal to, well, first of all, as I said earlier, I can factor out a delta x, since that's being multiplied by every term. So I have all of that times delta x. Now, if we're adding up a bunch of things, we can uh, use some notation to make it a little bit nicer we can use a capital sigma. So they're going to say this is going to take the sum of everything from i going from 1 to n, f of x sub i times delta x. Now, don't let this notation confuse you or scare you or anything. It's just an easy way to, to uh, indicate we're adding up a bunch of things. And all this says is that we're going to start with i equals 1. So you're going to start with wherever you see an i in your formula, put a 1 in for that. So what do we have? We have f of x sub 1 times delta x. Then let i go up to the next value. So the next one is i equals 2. So that would be f of x sub 2 delta x. And you keep going until you get to this ending point on the top of your sigma notation, which would be x sub n. So you finally get to that point there. So this says the same thing as the previous line. It just says it in a little bit nicer way. With that in mind, then, we can say that the area under the curve that we were talking about will be the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum, i goes from 1 to n, f of x sub i times delta x. And this is what's called the Riemann sum definition 
for the area under a curve. All right, we'll talk a little bit about distance and look at a couple examples in the next video.